This video is sponsored by Brilliant. I'm at Cairns Central Station about to board a train that will take me the length of Queensland, all the way down to Brisbane. It's a 25 hour journey, but in this video I won't just be traversing the landscapes of Australia, I'll also be journeying through the mathematical topic of dimensions. You heard that right, I'll be spending the next 25 hours on board this Spirit of Queensland train, studying shapes of higher dimensions, specifically the hypersphere. Hypospheres are notoriously hard to understand, and I'm not sure that it's possible to even understand them at all, let alone in a mere 25 hours. So come along with me, grab a cup of tea or make yourself a meal, then sit back and relax while the train carries us through these ideas. This video will document my train of thought, and I'm excited not only to see how much of this topic I can understand, but what the journey will be like. I've never taken an overnight train before. For this one, I've booked a rail bed seat. Here's my seat here. I'm grateful to have received one of the single window seats. This video would have been extra awkward if there was someone next to me. The chair is pretty comfortable as is, but later tonight, the staff will convert it into a bed for the overnight portion. I received a text message yesterday from the rail company saying that today's journey may be impacted by heavy rainfall and that travel is not guaranteed. That was a foreboding message to receive because now I'm not even sure if I will make it to Brisbane. There's a monsoon hitting the coast and potentially a cyclone forming, so who knows where I'm going to end up. Right now though, it's 9.30am and we're leaving Cairns on time. It's been a year since I made this short video touching on the idea of higher dimensions. This two-dimensional creature has locked some precious gems away in a safe. She's checked the safe from every angle and is sure that no one will be able to break in without a key. But she hasn't taken into account the idea that a three-dimensional creature, such as myself, might be peering in from above. She doesn't even know the concept of above. I could steal these gems without a key and without damaging the safe, and she would have no idea how they were taken. But we should keep an eye out for ourselves. A four-dimensional creature could steal from our safes without a key, could take the yolk from an egg without breaking the shell, appear in a closed room, or see inside of our brains. The fourth dimension is perpendicular to all of our normal 3D space directions, and we have no walls up against that direction. So building on this analogy, we have to try and imagine some higher dimensional space of four dimensions where creatures look upon us the same way we would look upon a creature of two dimensions. Now of course there are no two-dimensional creatures that actually exist in our world. A truly 2D creature couldn't exist here because they would have no thickness. In that same way, if there was a four-dimensional space, we probably would not exist in it because we have no thickness in the fourth dimension that we know of. You may be wondering, isn't time the fourth dimension? And to that I have another pre-baked clip for you. When I speak about a four-dimensional creature that can take the yolk from an egg without breaking the shell, I'm not treating time as the fourth dimension. I'm talking about four dimensions of space, and then add one of time on top of that. A one-dimensional creature living on a line could experience time. So could my friend in the second dimension. We have three dimensions of space in our world and one of time, but what's there to stop us from imagining a world with four, five, or a hundred spatial dimensions that also experiences the progression of time? Well, our brains might be incapable of truly imagining it, but we can try, and we have math to help us describe it. So whilst I can't tell you that higher dimensional spaces like a fourth, fifth, or sixth spatial dimension even exist, the cool thing about math is that it's super easy to just slap one extra variable onto many equations and start using them to describe shapes in higher dimensions. Math can go where our imaginations struggle to go, and equations can be used to see what things will be like in worlds that we cannot comprehend. 
Just as an example, if x is the side length of a square, then x to the power of 2 gives us the area of that two-dimensional shape. Raise this up by one dimension to the world of 3D, and it becomes a cube. Now to find out how much is inside the cube, we can do x to the power of 3, which gives the volume. Raise that up another dimension and we get a tesseract, or a 4D cube. They're hard to picture, but the space inside can be easily found by doing x to the power of 4 to get a value for the hypervolume. If only it were that easy for other shapes. Hyperspheres are what I'm interested in today. To find an equation for the hypervolume of one is a little more complicated, but still much easier than actually trying to imagine a hypersphere. Whenever I feel like I know what a 4D hypersphere looks like, it slips through my grasp like a fine mist. My hope is that if I can understand the math of hyperspheres, I'll be closer than ever to imagining what one looks like. If we told our two-dimensional friend that infinitely many circles stacked together in the third dimension makes a sphere, they would find that hard to imagine. I've spoken a big game about the fact that a four-dimensional hypersphere is made out of infinitely many 3D spheres, but how exactly are the spheres joined together in the fourth dimension? Well, your guess is as good as mine. One idea is that the spheres are stacked together like a string of pearls on a necklace. But that idea doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the string would need to be infinitely long to contain all the spheres of varying size. And besides, doing that with circles isn't what makes a sphere. So it's time to go back to the drawing board. I've got a couple of books about dimensions here with me and I'm making my way through those. The train had to stop for nearly an hour to wait for the northbound Spirit of Queensland to pass. After this we made a very brief stop in Tully and I got off to take a look around. Tully is home to one of the largest sugar mills in Australia and you can see it from all over town. We were supposed to be here for 10 minutes but as soon as I got off the whistle went to signify our imminent departure. The train driver was trying to make up some of the time we had lost waiting earlier. This is sugar cane country. A lot of the farms that you'll see from the window are sugar cane farms. These will get processed into raw sugar. There's also some banana farms and a few other tropical fruits. There's one very specific problem from the book that I want to solve on this trip and that is to compute the hypervolume of a fractal hypersphere of dimension 4.5. It sounds delightfully strange. What is a fractal hypersphere? And can a fractional dimension even have a hypersphere? I don't know. I'll first need to find an equation for the hypervolume and then pick the relevant numbers to put in. My last long form video was all about fractals. Fractals have detail at every scale. Something like the coastline of a country is between one and two dimensional because it is more than a line but less than a filled in shape. You can't accurately measure the coastline unless you are using a ruler that is also of the same fractional dimension. When I read this question in the book about the volume of a fractal hypersphere, I thought I must do that. A dimension of 4.5 means the space is something between a 4 and 5 dimensional space. Visualizing that is, I think, impossible. Can you imagine 4.5 perpendicular axes all at right angles to each other? Comparing volumes in different dimensions is tricky because they use different units. It's like asking if a cubic centimeter is bigger than a square centimeter. It doesn't really make sense to compare them because they are fundamentally different. That's the problem we'll face with the hypervolumes of spheres, but we're going to go full steam ahead regardless. Here's an interesting tidbit I've read so far. The longest diagonal of a cube in any dimension is m times the square root of n, where m is the side length and n is the dimension. So a stick 10 meters long could fit in a 100 dimensional hypercube of side length 1 meter. A hypersphere, however, cannot contain a stick longer than its diameter, no matter the dimension. I got to work deriving an equation for the hypervolume of a hypersphere in any dimension. 
I should make a note about vocabulary here. Technically, the word sphere only refers to the outer shell of a sphere-shaped object. It doesn't include the inside. The part contained inside a sphere is called a ball. So really, I'm trying to find the volume of a hyperball. The derivation of the equation is hard, but Dr. Payam has a video going through it fully. You start by finding a relationship that describes the shape of the hypersphere, and we use spherical coordinates, where each point is represented using n-1 angles and a radius. You then have to integrate to find the volume. You slice up the hypersphere in a similar way that you can find the volume of a sphere by slicing it up into disks and then adding the volume of each one. By the end of that, you get this formula, which is the holy grail for the question I want to answer. Okay, so I now have an equation for the hypervolume of a ball in any dimension. Um, the only problem is that it has something called the gamma function in it, which I don't know much about, so that's going to have to be the next thing that I'll figure out. Okay, here's a problem for you. This is my friend, a three-dimensional bee. Let's say their radius is two centimeters. Now imagine a swarm of a hundred bees. How many of them could you fit inside of a four-dimensional sphere, which has, say, a radius also of two centimeters? It's a bit of a trick question because the answer is actually all of them, or infinitely many of them, in fact. Just the same way that if you had a truly two-dimensional circle, you could fit infinitely many of those into a three-dimensional sphere. Because this bee doesn't have any thickness in the fourth dimension, you could fit infinitely many of them into a four-dimensional shape. Just so long as their diameter doesn't exceed that of the four-dimensional sphere, then you'll be good. If we were finding the volume of a hypersphere in an even-numbered dimension, such as 2, 4, or 6, then the formula simplifies to this. And if we were finding it in an odd-numbered dimension, then it becomes this. But take a look at the denominator of both. It involves taking the factorial of half the dimension, or of the dimension plus 1. Finding the factorial of a number is pretty straightforward. For example, the factorial of 6 is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. But finding the factorial of a fraction is where our quest gets derailed. We want the volume of a 4.5 dimensional hypersphere, and putting that into either of these existing formulas asks us to take the factorial in the denominator of either 2.25 or 5.5, which we can't do, at least not alone. The gamma function, this hook-like symbol on the denominator, is who shows up to steer us back on track when we encounter the challenge of fractional factorials. For integer values, the gamma function is the same as the factorial function, but shifted over by one. Its true power comes in its ability to interpolate between these integer values, though, for fractions. The gamma function is defined like this, for a positive value of n. This might look intimidating at first glance, but let's break it down. It was Euler who first introduced this form of the gamma function when trying to find a function that would smoothly bridge the gap between factorials at integer points and continuous values. The function essentially involves an integration process over a range from 0 to infinity. In this integral, the t to the n minus 1 part represents the core of the idea, extending the multiplication in factorials to continuous values, while e to the minus t is an exponential decay that ensures the integral converges, meaning it results in a finite value. These two together mimic the properties of factorials in a way that is well defined for fractional and even complex numbers. For Euler and other mathematicians of his time, it was like discovering a new railway line that connects previously inaccessible destinations. Our next quick stop was in Bowen, famous for its mangoes. It has a population of around 10,000. This Spirit of Queensland train is the only train that passes through many of these towns. And so not everyone's using it as a chance to learn about hyperspheres, some people are just getting from one town to the next. 
the Gamma function is a bit like one of those friends who just keeps popping up in random places. It is featured in the Riemann zeta function, which is key to solving one of the biggest problems in math, the distribution of prime numbers. The Gamma function also pops up when calculating decay rates in quantum physics and in defining the Gamma distribution in statistics used by engineers and weather forecasters. The gamma function can also be linked to trigonometry, because gamma multiplied by its inverse gives something called Euler's reflection formula with a sign in it. It reminds us that mathematical concepts are often deeply interconnected. That's all well and good, but um, my problem is I want to use the gamma function. I want gamma of 3.25, which is my 4.5 over 2 plus 1. But putting 3.25 into this integral gives me something that I have no idea how to solve. I spent the next little while researching techniques to solve this integral, but I had no luck. Any examples of people solving the gamma function integral, like this video from Black Pen Red Pen, tend to use numbers like a half, which have a trick to solving because they happen to use a well-known integration result. The gamma function of a half does work out to be the square root of pi, which is cool because again, math is weirdly interconnected when you least expect it. But calculating anything other than gamma of half integers seems a lot more difficult. And it was too much to spend the whole journey trying to study. I also had some time to myself. I brought along this book with me to read. It's The Three Body Problem. And this is at least my third attempt at trying to read it. It's a popular sci-fi story and I heard that it deals with the concepts of higher dimension. So I wanted to see how. Trapped on this train and having made the decision that I wouldn't use the TV in the seat to watch movies, I was faced only with the more difficult task of staring at the gamma function. And that did give me the motivation to finally stick it out with reading this book. And I'm glad I did. I did manage to finish it and was delighted that hyperspheres did get a mention. After dinner, an announcement on the train said that if you press the orange button, an attendant will come around with a special key and make your chair into a bed. I expected the footrest to just extend out and the chair to recline all the way down, so it blew my mind when the whole thing flipped from the opposite direction to reveal a bed. The mechanism must have been hiding in a hypersphere. Here I am trying to use random numerical approximations to solve the gamma function by hand, but these only left me in a confused haze with numbers that were way off. I didn't get a great sleep. At Proserpine and Mackay, quite a lot of new passengers boarded and all the seats actually filled up. The lie flat seats are comfortable, but not particularly private, and given that I was near the door, there was a lot of light and a loud sound every time someone opened the door between carriages. In the clarity of the morning, I wondered why I was so set on trying to solve the problem by hand. You can just type it into Wolfram Alpha or Google to find the gamma function of any number, and the computer does all the hard work for you. And eventually I realized that this isn't just the lazy approach for people who don't understand the integral, it's actually the best way to do it. Before computers, mathematicians would look up the value of the gamma function from books and huge tables that were painstakingly worked out over many years like scientists used to do for logarithms before our calculators could do it. And with this realization, I used a modern day table to find the gamma of 3.25. And using a calculator to work out the final formula, I found that the hypervolume of a fractal hyperball of dimension 4.5 and radius 1 is 5.15435. The author of this question never specified what the radius is, so we can choose it to be whatever we want, and that will change the answer. To see what impact the radius has, we can actually plot this hypervolume function over a range of values for the radius. And to go even further, and I found this very cool, we can make a 3D plot of the changing radius and dimension. I actually asked ChatGPT to plot this for me, and I was so impressed that it was able to do so. 
Initially, the pot looked like nothing because the volume increased so much in higher dimensions that it swamped out the lower ones. But using a log scale for the volume axis revealed more of the behavior. For each radius, the hypervolume will increase with increasing dimension before peaking in one dimension, then dropping off again and tending towards zero. Meaning that hyperspheres of infinite dimension have zero volume. That's very weird. For a radius of one, the volume peaks in the fifth dimension, or close to it. And for a radius of two, it peaks near the 24th dimension. Here's Bundaberg, home of the famous Bundaberg ginger beer. I had a shower on board in the morning and it was good, except for the parts where I had to hold on for dear life so as not to be thrown across the room. This bathroom could also really do with a place to store your stuff to avoid it getting wet. The food on this train has been really good. Here's me trying to look calm whilst drinking my tea as fast as possible after it started violently sloshing around. We're on a diesel tilt train, but the tilting mechanism gets turned off when we go through larger cities, making the ride a little bit bumpier there. I was playing around with the hypervolume formula for integers, and I found a way to find what radius of hyperball will have its volume peak in a given dimension. So for example, since we live in a world of three dimensions, I thought it would be interesting to see what radius of hyperball peaks in our world. The value I found was the square root of 2 over pi, or 0.79788. This number really intrigued me. It's irrational? It, is it meaningful? Is there some deeper interconnected nature to this value? Or is it just some lonesome train on a single track? From what I know of math, that seems unlikely. If you know of any significance behind this value, the radius of a hypersphere that peaks in the third dimension, please let me know. One very strange thing about hyperspheres is how their volume changes compared to that of a cube. Take a cube and put a sphere inside of it, the maximum size sphere that will fit, it touching all the faces of the cube. Now keep the same setup in higher dimensions. As the dimension increases, the sphere takes up a smaller fraction of the space inside the cube, leading to a wild difference between the two volumes. We see that in our volume formula. For a 100 dimensional version, the volume of the sphere will be close to zero inside of a vast cube. It's like a fly inside a cathedral, except because the sphere is still touching the cube on all its faces, it's still the maximum sized sphere that will fit inside. We escaped the worst of the weather, so the train did make it all the way to Brisbane in the end. Although a monsoon arrived at the same time as us, so I got 100% saturated by rain on my way out of the station. I could try to tell you that studying hyperspheres is useful. In fact, that very well may be true. Hyperspheres may help you understand advanced physics, cosmology, or even tangibly useful things like statistics and machine learning. These fields all make use of higher dimensions in some sense, but the reason I wanted to learn it was just for fun, because it's a weirdly interesting idea, and exactly because it offers an escape from reality. It isn't too surprising to me that a sci-fi book would include mention of hyperspheres, because spending time in a sci-fi world is similar to thinking about hyperspheres. You're in a world of your own imagination, whether you are guided by the author or by a mathematical formula. One day, maybe, I will find a way to use this hypervolume equation for something tangible, but that's a thought for another time, or maybe another train. Do you want a free and easy way to learn more math? Well, this video was sponsored by Brilliant, which is an amazing way to learn math, data science, and computer science interactively. With Brilliant, you can learn anywhere, including offline, on your phone, tablet, or computer. That means you can even use it to productively spend your next train ride. Brilliant makes it easy to build a daily habit of learning, to future-proof yourself in a world where science and math are increasingly important. Their course on multivariable calculus breaks down what it means to visualize data on three-dimensional plots, like the one I showed in this video. It's multivariable calculus that also helps us think about higher dimensions. We just add variables to our equations to represent the extra dimensions. It was multivariable calculus that allowed a derivation of the hypervolume formula. 
There are thousands of lessons on Brilliant, from basic to advanced topics, with new lessons added every month. So all aboard the learning train. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash tibbies or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thank you for watching this video and thanks to my Patreon supporters for making it possible. A special shout out to today's Patreon Cat of the Day, Sedna.